And thank you all for coming. This is a great crowd. Thought everybody with their masks and stuff. But <laughs> hey, Roy. Next meeting. Yeah, no, I'm glad I got this, got this one in because next month, who, who knows? But uh, I have been doing this for 40 years and uh, seen a few changes over the years. Uh, I can't think of any good changes, but uh, there's still fish out there. And uh, we have days even now that are as good as we've ever had. There are fewer and farther between, and the fish are generally quite a bit smaller, but it's still worth, you know, the day, going down there in the day. We uh, fish mostly with fly these days, but uh, spinning rods are welcome on my boat. And one good thing about the way the fishing has changed is the fish spend a lot more time in the a little bit deeper water off the edges of the flats. So if you're going down, say, Elliott Key or Sands Key. Having said that, uh, fishing is not what it used to be. Um, Ross is here to kind of tell you some of the things that we're trying to do in BTT to get the fishing back up to speed, although, you know, might not ever see those, you know, 20 fish days and those double digit bump fish that we used to see in my lifetime, but some of y'all are, are young enough that you'll see that. Or like I, our average fish when I first started uh, was seven pounds in the summertime and eight pounds in the, in the winter and fall. And now uh, I would say our average fish is three to four pounds. Still have some double digits, but um, you know, if you get one over 12 pounds, you, you just, like, should go buy some lottery tickets. <laughs> Do you want to say a few words now, Ross? Uh, I appreciate it, Bob. It's, it's a pleasure to have Bob talk to us and my organization and, and you all as well. He's so well versed in this, the Biscayne Bay fishery and a wealth of knowledge of how it's changed. And yeah, uh, a lot of our organization's work is to try to figure out why these declines that, that we've been hearing about have occurred and what we can do to fix it. And the long story short, there's not one real silver magic bullet to restore the fishery. It's going to take a lot of effort on a lot of fronts to make it happen. Uh, we, we can go into the details later. Uh, this includes fixing problems in, believe it or not, Cuba and Mexico and Belize, making sure that we treat our fish with the most respect possible so they don't only, not, so they only survive the, the encounter with us and the subsequent sharks but also don't associate the flats with a terrible time and stay in deeper water. And also fixing our water quality issues. The water quality issues not only affect the adult bone fish, but also the juvenile bone fish. Um, yeah, that's... Uh, I remember I've talked to you about some of those spawning aggregations that we get in the fall and, and uh, early winter, and they're always attended by sharks. And this one particular spot, which shall be unnamed. The fish are big. Uh, they're probably average eight pounds. There's plenty of 10, 12 pounders that get in this school of fish and maybe 100 to 200 individuals. But if you hook one, it's gonna get eaten by a shark. It's, it's really sad. I mean, it's a shallow flat, so it really can't get the motor going. So some days you just can't fish there if you, if you have to any respect at all for the fishery. Um, but some days that's the only place you find fish. When they get schooled up like that, it means that they're not spread out, so. But protecting spawning aggregations and making sure our fish spawn is just, it's essential to making any fishery be sustainable. And for bone fish, when they form their aggregations, they're super vulnerable to fishing pressure, sharks, all sorts of stuff. And we're trying right now to identify those spots to, to protect them, not only from from, from fishing, but also from people that maybe running over with jet skis and things like that, that would get them on edge and not make them spawn as strongly, and other, uh, other avenues right there. So what we're doing is we're putting the tracking infrastructure that Tom spoke about, and following the fish in Biscayne Bay, where, where they might spawn, and we're coupling that with ocean current models to see if you're a bonefish, where would you want to spawn to make sure that your next generation is provided for in the Keys? We've mapped some areas, and they seem to be towards Key West. And so now we're, we're tagging bonefish and tracking them. And sure enough, we had a fish 
just recently moved 30 miles to this area west of Key West, presumably to spawn. And um, this is great news. It's a great discovery. But the the, the, the major issue is there's like a, it's like a million jet skis running right over it, and there's a bunch of turtle boats in that potential area. So we're trying to work with those organizations and once we find it to develop some boundaries around it. And like you guys run a quarter mile out that way, or you know, not go there during the summer, spring and uh, summertime. We've done some science using uh, expert interviews and whatever data sorts available from Biscayne National Park and others to track the, the monitor the decline of bone fish or in, um, in Biscayne Bay, it seemed the decline was the most recent. And as Bob said, it kind of accelerated in around 2000 2005. Stay on the track till the freeze, then it you know, really kind of accelerated even further. And the, the, the reasons for that, we've done some fancy math with different stock assessment models and all that. And it seems to be two parts. Something happened to the adults where they're not able to get to maximum size. But at the same time, and equally important is something happened where we lost our juveniles were not surviving or our, uh, or we weren't getting any water bags. And we've, we've done some studies that I'll, I'll talk about later, looking at where our larvae are coming from. As Bob said, because bonefish spawn in such a crazy way, that a lot of our larvae are, are coming from places like Cuba and Belize and Mexico. And right about the same time, we, we noticed the decline. Cuba had some very interesting social economic policies in play where they started netting everything and using that as a source of protein. And right, yeah, right as then, we saw that in Belize also was getting a, little, getting a little heavy on their netting, and so was Mexico. So we're working now internationally to try to try to rectify those issues. Yeah, we had no idea until the UT that, that our own fish came from someplace else. We all figured that we take care of our fish, they'll always come back. And we always thought that they'd spawn right there on the flats, which, yeah, none of that was true. So they still pretty much think that they spawn way offshore, and, and the larvae floats out of our fish is larvae floats out of the area. So we need those guys to take care of their fish. No, I mean, we have a lot of marine users in the Ryan environment. We gotta make sure our, our fishery has its stake because it's an economic engine that generates $465 billion, million dollars a year to the, the Monroe County economy. And uh, it, needs, it, needs its, it needs its value to be protected. And that means making sure the jet skis and other users are front runner to go over. Water quality. There's yeah. an issue too. Yeah. Um, you know, all the things that affect Florida Bay in a smaller degree affect this camp bay. Um, shrimp migration and stuff like that. Like last year, we had no shrimp at this camp bay, so it was, we couldn't even buy bait. So um, I think that was directly related to all the water problems that we've had. Probably red tide had something to do with it, but it seems better this year. And we don't seem to have all that sargassum weed that we've had the last couple of years. At least it hasn't started yet. Fingers crossed. Ross, uh, is there any effort being made for your uh, hatchery process? It, it's going on very well. I, we, at, at the peak of the decline in 2010, when there were many people in Isla Mirada and, and the Middle Keys crying that if their fishery's gone, they're gonna have, you know, they're gonna have to drive taxis. Um, and a lot of our people that love bonefish fishing were so worried about the fishery, we invested in a program to um, build the technology to, if, if the event was needed, to put a one-shot batch of larvae and recruits into the Keys to restore our, our fishery. And that would be through a program where we would breed them and raise them in captivity. And th this program has made a lot of strides but the most important stride is it really helped us figure out this really complex and crazy life cycle of the bonefish. It's nothing like anything else in the world. Um, the progress of that, that program has been great. Uh, we are basically one step or, or two steps away from putting it all together. Uh, the, the steps mean you have to make a bonefish who wants to spawn in 400 feet of water spawn in a tank uh, when, when you can't really simulate those conditions. You need to develop this alien-like larvae, which is literally an alien. I wish we had a picture of one. You, yeah. you could not believe that this was a bonefish. Uh, the one will come up, and I'll come up later. But yeah, and, and uh, when the scientists got it, they looked at it and they're like, "This is 
I don't know what to feed this thing. I've never, no one's ever seen a thing like this in the world. Um, so we're, we're, we're developing the right kind of planktonic snow food that it needs to eat. And we're getting close. We have one survive uh, longer, than, longer than anyone else has recently. And then we've got the juveniles. We got the juvenile stage all super happy. They, we, can, we can grow a bonefish to the juvenile life stage really fast. So we just need to get them to figure out the right hormone cocktail to get them to spawn, and then figure out the right food to give to these babies, and then then, then done. A computer modeling of the currents and stuff, and it's you know it's pretty obvious when you put that time frame in that you know, they're not coming from here, and they're not coming from the Bahamas. They can't get across the. I mean, they could swim across as an owl because they have had a couple of tankfish that swam from here to, to the Bahamas and were recaptured. But they, I think, honestly, they, they pretty much think that that was a hurricane event, I think. On the hurricane event, actually, I think uh, Paul Dixon, after Hurricane Sandy, was finding bonefish on like Long Island Sound. Oh, my God. That's where they went. <laughs> <laughs> We've never identified a bowfish nursery in South Florida, right? Oh, that's a great question. Uh, that has been a huge challenge for us. But we, we didn't really start looking until the bonefish fishery was kind of going down. And if we're not getting any larvae from Cuba and our bonefish aren't spawning like they're supposed to, it kind of makes sense that um, they're hard to find. But the, two, the 2010 cold event actually provided us an opportunity to learn a little bit more about where the babies could be. And when all those bonefish died, we had researchers netting them all up, and they brought them back to lab. We did all sorts of stuff with them. Uh, one thing we did was we took out the ear bones, which acts as like a, a log book of where the fish had been for its whole life. And we were able to drill down into its ear bone to its early life, you know, one year old, zero year old. And we found out those fish seemed a, a, more, more often than not had a kind of a brackish water signature that was more variable. And then once they got older, it became more just straight up marine and stable. And with that information, we started looking in some of these places, these brackish water spots, and we're finding them there now. Like an average fish was a lot larger. You were probably, correct me if I'm wrong, seeing a lot more life as well, a lot more yellow jacks and rays. And uh, the point of the question is, could it be a food source thing as well? And if BTT has addressed that. Yeah, I thought that that's what the problem was when things started to go south. But they, BTT did a study on, on prey items, and, and they had some old ones that they used as kind of, uh, I don't know what you call that, but they, they could pay, compare. And there's plenty of stuff for them to eat in the day. It might not be the, the stuff that they really like, but there's all sorts of crabs and shrimps and, and uh, you know, small bait fish and snails and you know, puppy dog tails and all sorts of stuff. I'm going to talk about fly fishing for a little while. Yeah. Okay, so I don't know. Spin fishing is kind of easy. All you got to do is find the fish, which, you know, that's always been the hardest part. Even the, when there were shitloads of them, there were days when we couldn't find any. So finding them, okay, you got to find some first. And if you, like, you use that technique with the jig and, and cast them a little bit deeper water, sometimes as deep as five feet along the channel edges, um, you can probe with that or, you know, just cover a lot of ground with that while you're sight fishing. Same with fly fishing, I always have a fly on that I think I'll permanently lead as well because it's, you just don't have time to switch rods to go from fly to permanent fly to you know, bonefish fly. So that's one tip that I would say, use a fly that can catch both. A small crab fly or like my little poxy fly works pretty well. The main thing about fly fishing for bonefish is a couple things you have to remember. The, the color's got to be what they want. Uh, the sink rate has to be in the right parameters. Obviously, if it's a strong current on this flat and it's a little bit deeper, you're going to have to have a lot more weight on the fly to get it, you know, to go down. Conversely, if you're on a flat and it's real calm and it's real shallow, if you throw that big old bomb of a fly out there, it's going to freak them out. So use a really light fly when they're tail and they're in real shallow water. Um, work the fly. Uh, just a little bit faster than the fishing movement. So if they're going real slow tailing, don't, you know, drift it real fast by them. Just kind of keep it about their speed. If they're mudding, they'll be more likely to hit a quicker moving fly. But, but there again, 
Uh, the key is to, to have that blood get down to where they are. Sink rate's really important. And size. Color, sink rate, and size are, are because they're honestly pretty democratic. They'll, they'll eat a lot of different stuff. Um, if you work it properly and it passes those three tests, I, I think the bonefish, out of all three of our big three, are the most honest. If you make a good cast and work it right, you're probably going to get bite. <coughs> And uh, permit, I'll just say that I have a little fly that I use. I use it all the time. I like to strip the fly. So I, you know, I fish aggressively for them, throw it right to them, strip it away from them, and, and kind of tease them into bite them. And I, I do that pretty much with my, uh, my belt fish technique too, but most of that is geared for a little bit deeper water like muddy fish. Can't do that with tail fish. Tail fish is much more delicate. Smaller flies, you know, timing is, is important. If you wait till the fish goes down and is rooting around, and you can put that really light fly that doesn't make any noise when it hits, you can get that right in front of him. When he stops mudding and he looks up and that fly's right there, you've got a good chance you'll get him to eat. Plus, when he's digging, he's not going to be quite as wary as he'll be if he's just swimming. Hearts wants to catch the ones at their backs of the water and they're just swimming slow on the flat. Obviously, you've been cast at it, but don't expect much from those guys. Okay, for color, for me, I use three colors for my flies. Jigs, I usually use brown or pink. From, or actually, sometimes I use four colors. But, but in the wintertime, I like pink flies, bright pink. Um, but my regular fly is, is kind of a red squirrel tailed, kind of reddish brown. Epoxy fly. And I use that 99% of the time. In the wintertime, if that doesn't work, if I throw it to them, they act like they don't see it, I put a pink fly on. And also in the summertime, if it's rainy and real dark outside, and I throw my brown fly and they act like they don't see it, and the guys made it a reasonably good cast, I put a yellow fly on. If they see, at least in my experience, they see yellow, or maybe even chartreuse, but I like yellow best if any kind of those conditions. And white I use on real white bottom, which we don't have a lot of, but sometimes when we chum, we chum over white bottom and, and a white fly works best. Practice your casting, backhand in the wind. That's a like a skill that most people need and few people have. And some days every shot you have is backhand into the wind. Sorry, but that's or if you're a lefty that works. But then if you're a lefty, all the fish will be on the wrong side anyways. Fired with a fly rod of seven, eight lots of 30 feet away consistently. Is that gonna be okay or 30 feet? Um that's that's if you can get out there quickly 30 feet, you can catch most of our fish. 40 feet's better, but you don't have to cast 60 feet. If you can cast 40 feet, I that's what I tell people. It, it, so I about accuracy? Accuracy is important. You know, you have to get, you know, in a box as far in front of them. And, and if there's 20 of them, okay, that box is bigger. So, you know, you'll be a star if you find a big school. If it's a single fish, what they tend to do, and it's maddening, they'll be coming along perfectly, and you drop it right there, and they go that way. <laughs> so, I mean, you made a good cast, but you didn't keep coming. That means that uh, that's why we, we're aggressive when we cast. We try to, I, no more than three feet from them when, I, when I'm throwing that fish. And then, then if, they're, if it's real shallow, it's calm and everything, and three feet scares them, I'll back off a little bit. But like an arm's length, I don't want it any farther than that from them. Unless it's like super deep or super calm. What advice would you, I'm seeing them as the hardest part, you made a great joke about it. Do you have any tricks or advice on how to improve your eyes? Well, it just takes practice. So you don't ever want to stare at one spot because whatever you're staring at is going to turn into a you're going to square it's a fish. So it's, I stand. So I'll take like an area about as big as this room in front of me, all the way back to the back door. And I'll start over here and I'll just look, kind of just stand back and forth. If I see something, I'll look away and then look back, see if it's moved. 
see if it's changed. Uh, see, you know, if that color has changed a little bit, or if now it looks like it's quite facing this way. Yeah, that's definitely a fish. So that's what I do. And then, you know, in to out, back and forth. And look for movement and color. If it's brown, it's going to be a shark. It's not going to be a bone fish. Although sometimes permanent look brown, but um, if it's got a blue tail, it's a bone fish. If it's got a black tail, it's often a barracuda. Although permanent have black tails. Yeah, yeah. For fly, I, the only time I use <laughs> fluorocarbon is is for heavy leader, shock tippet. But I, I use um, Rio. It's stiff. It's it's large diameter. They're not really leader shy. And I'll use 12 pound most of the time, 15 for permit, tied up in the fly. And um, I don't like fluorocarbon because I have bad experiences with it not holding knots when it first came out. It's better now. And, and arguably, it's better for leader material because it sinks faster, especially for is what you want when you're bone fishing. But I just don't. I don't use it. How long is it? Well, so I'll use um, typically a, you know, 11, 12 foot leader, and I'll start with 40 or 30 pound test at the butt, and then 20, 15, 12 for bone fish, and just taper it down, you know, like three feet each. Simple. Bring one of your epoxy I did not bring one because it's proprietary. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I forgot, but, but I, everybody knows about it. They're not secret or anything. You can buy them at some of the shops. It, it's been very, very good for me. Um, it just looks like a little wiggle jig, kind of that some of you guys I don't know, so you probably don't know the fly, but it's just it's a I take a, a one oh hook, must have 34007, it seems to work best for me, and I'll tie uh, some red fox squirrel up like that, about halfway down the shank, up over the bend of the hook like that. Then I'll turn it over and I'll put two eyeballs, medium sized eyeballs which are weighted, uh, commercially available, uh, lead eye. And then I'll, I'll make 12 of those like that, and then I open up <coughs> the glue, epoxy, mix it up, and it's kind of the consistency of like a taffy, thick taffy. So I have a turner that I use, and it dries in about, you got about an hour to work for it before it gets real gummy. And, um, you know, just dab it on with the toothpick until it gets the right shape. It's kind of a diamond shape. And you don't want it to be real fat, so as flat as you can make it, the better. It tends to kind of go like that. When you, put, when you strip it, definitely comes up. And the weight brings it down, it kind of wobbles like that. It works. I mean, I, you know, what can I say? I, I could use any kind of fly. And, and you know, people bring other flies with me. <laughs> Flats, uh, they'll call rays. Uh, some flats they mud a lot. Some of the harder bottom flats they don't mud as much. Well, they try to mud, but it's hard, so it doesn't make much mud. Um, so then you just see them, you know, swimming. But uh, people always, we'll be going down a flat, the guy says, I don't see any rays or sharks or anything. And I said, well, we're not shark fishing. <laughs> you know, how do you know? It's good. <laughs> hey guys, let's give it up for Bob Ross.